back during World War II, when it looked like America was going to be defeating Japan and occupying the country. The armed forces were concerned about how the Japanese would respond to the occupation. So they got in touch with an anthropologist to do a study of Japanese culture. This is Ruth Benedict. Her specialty was the raising of children in different cultures. And so she did an analysis of Japanese culture, even though she herself was not a specialist in that culture. But she looked at their ways of raising children. And she came up with a theory that there are two types of culture in the world guilt cultures and shame cultures. It has to do with how parents reprimand their children, punish their children, the arguments they give when they punish the children. In a shame culture, the child is told, don't do that. It embarrasses us in front of the neighbors. In a guilt culture, you're told, don't do that. It hurts me when you do that. And Buddhism is basically a shame culture. The West, up until recently, was a guilt culture. And the dynamic of the two is very different. Shame cultures can tend to give rise to people who are mentally unstable, if they are mentally unstable. They can tend to go into psychosis. Guilt cultures, mentally unstable people, tend to go into neurosis. But everybody internalizes something of both. In some cases it has to do with how your parents raised you. In other cases it has to do with your, your karmic background as you come into this life. Two children can live in the same family and pick up very different messages from the parents. But the important thing is that you learn how to examine feelings of guilt, feelings of shame to see where they're useful and see where they're not. Buddhism doesn't have much use for guilt. This may have to do with the fact that it also doesn't talk much about justice. There was that Onion article years back. They quoted a member of the radical Gamatana sect. Where they got the name Gamatana, I have no idea. But they placed it in Tibet, of course. And they said there was a video that was released by this radical sect threatening to unleash waves of peace and harmony around the world. And in the, in the video it said, you cannot stop us. Of course, the U.S. Defense Department says they're going to do the best they can to stop this. But the article made a point, an important point. In the guilt cultures that we have, especially in monotheism, there's a sense that justice will be done one way or another. Whereas in Buddhism, it doesn't talk about justice at all. It talks about being skillful in your behavior. Now, sometimes skillfulness does involve punishing people who are wrong, but you're not necessarily trying to get justice done. Think of the case of Mangulimala, all those people he'd killed. And then he, the Buddha saw that he had a potential, and so he taught him. And Gulimala was able to give up his ways, become an arahant. And the karmic consequences of all that, all that killing he'd done, was simply that as he was on his alms run, there were people who were probably upset that he had literally gotten away with murder. They would throw things at him, sometimes tear his robe, sometimes bash his bowl, sometimes bash his head. But as the Buddha said, it was a lot less than the consequences would have been if you hadn't gained that attainment. So the whole purpose of Buddhism is not to settle scores and to bring about justice. So the question of guilt doesn't come in. Feelings of guilt are not encouraged. There's a passage where the Buddha says, when you recognize that you've done something wrong, the proper response is one is to recognize that it's wrong and that you don't want to repeat it. And then have lots of goodwill. Develop all the Brahma Viharas by starting with goodwill. Goodwill for the person you wronged, 
goodwill for yourself, and then goodwill for everybody. Goodwill for yourself is to remind yourself that by punishing yourself, you don't gain anything. Part of the psychology of guilt, someplace in there, there's a feeling that if you punish yourself a lot, then others who might want to punish you will hold back. So you, you can preempt them. But from the Buddhist point of view, karma doesn't necessarily have to bring about justice. There are consequences, but there is an out. You practice in a willful path, you gain awakening. And you don't have to meet up with all the karma consequences of what you've done. There's that image the Buddha gives of throwing a hunk of salt into, into a river. He starts out by saying that if everything you did had to be, everything bad you did had to be punished, there'd be no way anybody could get an awakening. But the actions you do will give results of the sort that they are. In other words, unskillful actions will give rise to pain. Skillful actions will give rise to pleasure. But the pain will be greatly reduced as your mind gets more expansive. Again, more expansive with goodwill. Here are the images of throwing a crystal of salt, a large crystal of salt, into a rare of water. And you can still drink the water because there's so much more water than there's salt. Whereas if you don't have an expansive mindset, haven't developed a mind in virtue and discernment, learning to be not overcome by pleasure or pain, then your mind is like a small cup of water. You throw that large crystal of salt in and you can't drink the water, it's too salty. So regardless of what happens in the past, you can develop your mind so that you can mitigate the results of past bad karma. So the proper response is not guilt. As the Buddha says, you, you can't go back and erase what you did by feeling really guilty. And it's not a question of preventing punishment by punishing yourself. Instead, you just realize the best that can be asked of a human being is to recognize a mistake, to resolve, not to repeat it, and then actually carry through with that resolve. Thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity. These all help to strengthen that resolve. So when you find your mind in a spiral of guilt, remind yourself that there are ways of thinking that would encourage that and tell you that it's a good thing. But the Buddhist way is not one of those ways. Because again, the question of punishment doesn't come up, the question of guilt doesn't come up. He does, though, recommend shame of a particular sort. There are basically two kinds of shame. There's a shame that's the opposite of pride, and there's a shame that's the opposite of shamelessness. These are two very different things, even though they have the same name. And both of them are related, and that basically you want to look good in the eyes of others. Like those Japanese parents who told the children, don't do that, it makes us embarrassed in front of the, in front of the neighbors. But the Buddha says that you have to be careful to choose whose eyes you want to look good in. Think of the noble ones, and John Mun, and John Lee, John Mahabur, Ki Nanayon. What would they say of your behavior? And if you want to look good in their eyes, the Buddha would encourage that. Because that sense of shame, he says, is what protects the world. When people are shameless, they can do anything they want. They don't care what other people say. And if we look around us, and we see the, the damage that can be done by shameless people, the people who lie and have no sense of shame, the people who kill and have no sense of shame, or order others to kill and have no sense of shame about it. Those are the people you wish would have some more shame. But you can't spend your time worrying about other people. You've got to worry about yourself. You look at your behavior and ask yourself, what can I do to follow the precepts in a way that is pleasing to the noble ones, would look good in their eyes? And then there's what the Buddha calls having the world as a governing principle. When your thoughts are going astray, away from the path, 
And here you're, you're on a path that leads to true happiness, and yet you stray away from it. When the noble ones who can read minds would see that, what would they think? The Buddha actually encourages you to, to think about these things. And again, think about what their eyes are like. They're the eyes of compassion. They're not out there to try to punish people who do wrong. They have a lot of compassion for people who are doing wrong. But their compassion is not just being nice. Sometimes their compassion can come down pretty strong, saying, hey, this is really not the kind of behavior you want to be engaged in. But still, it's for you, the sake of your own happiness. So those are the kind of people whose eyes you want to look good in. That kind of shame is one of the treasures in the path. The Buddha talks of it as a treasure. He talks about it as a protection. In his image of the practice as being like a, a fortress, shame and compunction are the road that surrounds the fortress, the moat that surrounds the fortress to keep out the enemy. In the list of treasures, shame and compunction come together as one of the noble treasures. The Buddha calls them guardians of the world. It's because of this kind of shame, i.e. the shame that's the opposite of shamelessness, and it's actually a correlate of pride that we behave well. Think about that time when the Buddha was teaching his son, Rahula, to regard his harmful actions as shameful. We're talking about members of the Noble Warrior caste. They had a strong sense of pride. And the correlate of that is that they wouldn't want to do anything that was beneath them. It's a quality you would want to have in leaders of society who have a sense of nobility. And the healthy shame that goes along with that, the shame that would make them ashamed to do something that was lowly and mean. Again, this is a quality that we could use a lot more of in this world, and each of us can use a lot more in our own behavior. To have high regard for yourself, and part of having high regard is recognizing that some things are beneath you, and you'd be ashamed to do them. And if you want to look good at somebody's eyes, choose the noble ones. They're wise, compassionate. They have your best interests at heart. And as you internalize their attitude, you can learn how to, how to have your best interests at your own heart. So when you see yourself getting involved in unskillful thoughts, and the Buddha regards thoughts of guilt as unskillful. Learn how to step back. You have that ability to step back. This is what makes human beings special. We're not just embedded in instinct. We can step back and look at our actions. And even when they're pretty strong and we haven't figured out how to stop unskillful thoughts, at the very least we can step back from them and say, well, I'm not going to get involved. I'll watch. But stay separate. And learning how to maintain that sense of the separate observer put you in a position where you really can do something about your thoughts, direct them in a much better direction.